Voy a dar una charla en inglés. Ok, I'm going to do it in English because it's easier for me. But uh, I will maybe use some words in Spanish or Portuguese because it's so close. Anyway, I will start in English and uh, I hope you, uh, uh, you can follow me or if not, you can just stop me and I will translate to Spanish. Okay, so uh, this is the title of my talk. It's in Portuguese so most, mo more people can come. But everything that he touched was gold. So I'm going to talk about gold chemistry uh, for the most part. The, uh, but I want to tell you about what we do in my research. Uh, we do um, ha have a variety of, of areas of research. Uh, it looks like a stock market. A traditional stock, meaning you buy stock from uh, Petrobras in the old days when Petrobras was good. You, can, is, you know you're going to get some money back. But you also have to do high risk, high rewards. You have to do research that is, that is safe and research that is risky. The research that is safe, I do it in medicinal chemistry, natural products. The research that is risky, that, is could ha that can work or not, I do it myself, alone. So we've, we, we work with many people from different universities, just John Hopkins and, uh, and Universidad Peruana Cayetano Heredia in Lima, or uh, in France, and talk about uh, natural medicinal chemistry, uh, basically uh, Leishmania, Trypanosoma, malaria, uh, uh, or for example, anti-cancer agents, always with a different or other universities, other institutes, um, because I don't have expertise in uh, biology. I, I'm just a chemist. But I do that because it's good to have a variety of research areas. But let's talk about what I'm going to tell you today. Today I'm going to tell you about high risk. Yo quiero que ustedes aprendan de mi experiencia. Eh, Como mm, ustedes van a ser professionals, profesionales, muy pronto y van a ser independientes. Vean mi ejemplo para que decidan cómo enfocar su vida independiente. How, how you, I want you to learn from me, so you can at least don't make the same mistakes I make. Okay? Now, that, what, what, what is this? What, what, is, that, what, is, what is this? Huh? It's an apple. Can you see something else? What can you see? A sad person. A sad person. So a reaction, <laughs> that's true, a sad person. And how about this one? <laughs> a happy person. Okay, a reaction can tell us many things. It's, so just like fruit, em, discarded fruit, em, I mean fruit that you have already eaten have, has value, Reactions have value. What is in a reaction? Well, these are, what do you think this is? What kind of fruit or, or, or vegetable? Huh? Uh, cebola, right? Cebola? Cebola. Cebola? Cebola. Cebola. But it doesn't look like cebola, right? It depends on how you look at the cebola. So layers and layers, cebola has muchas uh, capas, no? They, each one tells us something. So from a cebola, you can make a work of art, a flower. This is my wife. Pierre, Pierre knows my wife. My wife is a photographer. She, she's all, all these are pictures of her pictures. She's a, a professional photographer. An art, she's an artist. So una, a, a piece of trash can give art. Reactions can do the same. And let me tell you something. When you go to the, to, the, to the real world, outside UFR Jota, outside this campus, always think this. Never, the, the most fundamental and lasting objective of synthesis is not the production of new compounds, but the production of properties. You don't want to make compounds, just to make compounds. Make compounds because they mean something. They, they have some value. You are learning something. So what? I, so we ha, we are. I'm an organic synthetic person. Organic synthesis. Okay. What is? What? Could I, can, what do I? What are the elements of my trade? What are my tools? Mis herramientas. Mis ferramentas. Ferramentas. Substrato. 
Re reactivo, reagent, rea no, reactivo. Huh? Reagents and products. That's it. So we have to work with only those three. Actually, we have to work with these two. A substrate and reagent, that's it. But it's not about making many compounds, it's about making properties, learning about properties. So we're gonna I'm going to tell you a story about reagents and a story about substrates from my own experience. How simple a substrate, a simple reagent, can give us layers and layers of information, like the cebola. You have to just look, look carefully. And we're going to start with gold. Gold has been around for only 10, 10, 12 years, 15 years, and, uh, and it's really going up. There's a lot of uses for gold catalysis. It's a really powerful um, field. And therefore, a lot of interest. Why? Well, very simply, it has pi acidity. It's a soft Lewis acid, has a large radius. Uh, it activates a pi system like an alkyne, alkene. It has a good affinity for alkynes. And that's the crucial property that people like about gold. And gold 1 and gold 3 are used, <coughs> are the, 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 the typical catalyst. Gold 1 is the most popular. It's uh, by coordinate, so it's li linear. And the, the advantage of gold is that there's no beta hydride elimination, just like in palladium or other transition metals. That's, those are interesting features, interesting properties of gold. We entered the field of gold about six years ago, when one of my students discovered the uh, a vinyl gold and isolated a vinyl gold intermediate in the cyclization of this est, uh, alanyl ester to the lactone. We, dis we found this by accident, but this told us that the vinyl gold, gold attached to a carbon, was the true intermediate in the, rea in the catalysis of gold. And then we started to try to discover newer and more powerful reactions. But gold <laughs> Is, 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 is you can do two things. You can try to discover new reactions, and, and every time it's going to be harder and harder, <laughs> cada vez más de encontrar nuevas reacciones de oro, porque la, es como una mina, se, se acaban las reacciones. Or you can do, learn about how can I improve gold? How can I make it more powerful? Not the reactions, gold. The, cat the catalyst. And even though there's a lot of uh, reviews on gold, there's not n there are many problems with gold. First, large loadings, 5%. Difficult intermolecular reactions, poor stereoselectivity. Gold is, one, is easily reduced, oxidized, so it's, it's not very stable. And most people don't think gold is that important. It's just they think it's just a fat proton, it's just a strong, a, a big acid, that's all. So there's a lot of uh, room to learn, room for improvement. How can we learn more? How can we make gold more powerful? How can we make, those, how can those layers of se onion, cebola, 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 can we, what can they tell us more? How can we learn more? How can we use it to make art? So just, I'm going to tell you some stories, very some I brought a lot of slides, I brought many. I'm not going to do all of them because otherwise we will be here until five o'clock. But I will do some important slides, or I will talk about some important aspects of, the, of my work. So this was the first one. Um, we found, look, this is strange. If you look at this paper from a very well-known chemist, Dean Toast, you see that, uh, don't, don't worry about what happens, don't worry about the reaction mechanism. Just look at what he found. He found that the a ligand, this phosphine ligand, the, the, the more electron poor they are, the better it is for the reaction. 
So this is a very electron poor ligand because of that trifluoromethyl uh, substituent. It's better than that trimethyl uh, that trimethoxy, which is electron rich. However, in, a, in another gold catalyst reaction, an electron rich ligand is much better than an electron poor ligand. Why? Why just why using the same catalysis but different reaction changes the ligand? People didn't know why. And we thought it would be important to know why. So we looked at um, other cases. This is a hydroamination reaction. And here you can see that the, uh, the conversion goes very quick, 100% conversion very fast, when you have a very electron-rich ligand. But also when you have another very electron-rich ligand like this tricyclohexylphosphine, the reaction doesn't work. No reaction. So in some, the same reaction, a good a electron rich ligand with, works, but another electron rich ligand doesn't work. Why? Why all that? So we started to work in, and looking into the catalysis, doing physical organic chemistry. And we've, uh, what we decided to do is to look at the key um, cycle, catalytic cycle, of gold. The key catalytic cycle has uh, three stages, two stages really. Uh, stage one, which is the activation of the alkyne or the alkene or the alene by gold, cationic gold. This activation leads to a nucleophilic addition like this, like you see with, uh, on, the, uh, on the slide. This uh, is the vinyl gold intermediate that we discovered. And this then goes to the next stage, which is the protodioration, a, a re a replacement of the gold by a proton. This is stage two. Uh, stage three is the decay, a cationic gold. That is, uh, how, and this happens very often. Uh, it's a danger. Uh, that's the reason why gold is, um, so sen uh, is so sensitive to the uh, reaction conditions. So that's the reason why you need a lot of gold uh, to uh, carry out reactions. So our goal was to learn about effects and add the, uh, the effects of ligand and or additives, if there was, if there were, if you needed additives, so that we can learn how can we improve a reaction or not. And so what we did, and this is something that Weibo, a former student of mine, did. She decided to do a three-phase strategy. First, establish experimentally the structure-activity relationship between a ligand, a structure, and the kinetics of each stage in the gold catalytic cycle. Each stage stage one and stage two. Then uh, she categorized the gold catalyzed reactions according to the rate determinant step. And finally, she investigated selected examples of the, of the literature and see if, they, if, if it matches, if it matches what she found out. And what she found out, and it was published just a couple of years ago, it was a big article, was that um, electron poor ligands help stage one. In other words, if, you, if the reaction is, <coughs> if the, if the, if in one type of reaction, reactions in which the first step is uh, the rate determinant step, an electron poor ligand. Here you can see electron poor ligand improves the reaction, electron rich ligand does not improve the reaction. And this, in this case, the reaction goes very fast to the formation of the vinyl gold intermediate and very slow to the, to the next step. So in this type of reactions, electron poor ligands help. Now, however, if you have other type of reaction here, for example, you have a, a, a vinyl gold that is going to, that is, uh, can be isolated. When you uh, treat this with proton, with a strong acid, the deprotonation takes place and it, it is helped by having electron rich ligands. So the more electron rich ligands you have, the faster the reaction. Okay, so what we found out is that uh, electron-rich ligands, and we did a Hammett uh, correlation, I'm just, uh, electron-rich ligands uh, help the protodioration, help to do what? To improve the reaction. So here what we, are di what we dis disco uh, discovered is that you can have two types, or we categorize gold catalyzed reactions in two forms, in two types, type one, type two. In type one, is the one where stage one, this stage, is the 
rate determining step, that is the a nucleophilic addition to the alkyne. Type 2 is the, the, the reaction in which the stage 2, the, the protodeuration, the replacement of the gold by the proton, is the, is the rate determining step. And we all, furthermore, we subdivided the type 1 and type 2 uh, gold catalyzed reactions into two subgroups. Uh, uh, type 1, where decay is not significant, and type one in which decay is significant and type two where decay of gold is not significant and type two where decay of gold is significant so four categories and that helped us to predict and to explain every reaction in the literature in other words now we understand now we can understand for example this reaction that i mentioned to you earlier by toast here it is. It is. It is. Um, it, is uh, it makes sense that the, the electron poor ligand enhances the reaction rate. Why? Because this type of reaction is a type one in which the uh, the nucleophilic addition to the alkyne, in other words, in, uh, to the aline, the nucleophilic addition of the nucleophile to the aline, is the rate determinant step. And that means that for that, according to our category, our, according to our to our uh, uh, categorization, when you have a type one, you have you need an electron withdrawing um, reaction or a ligand. So that does that make sense? Well, it, it uh, you will see that in a, another example. Here you can see an, uh, another a type two reaction. This is where the protodeuration is the rate determinant step, and here uh, uh, a electron donating ligand like this tricyclophosphine phosphine it improves the reaction tremendously compared to other uh, electron withdrawing substituents why is that because again look look at this uh, look at if you look at the uh, uh, substrate the uh, sorry material the intermediate and the product you can see that the intermediate has the vinyl gold so the pro for here to finish here, for this to become this, for the intermediate to become the product five, you need to have a ligand like AR3 that is going to provide electronic de density to the gold so that the gold can pump electronic density to the double bond and the double bond becomes more nucleophilic and uh, attacks a proton. I'm just going to uh, bypass these examples and just tell you a little bit about wh how this uh, early study on gold told us more about gold. Now you, we know something about gold. I just tell you briefly that um, we now can uh, rationalize ligands. We can, we can predict that if you, the, uh, according to the type of reaction, if it's type 1, you're going to need one set of ligand. What type of ligand? A electron poor ligand. If it's type 2, you need an electron rich ligand. Okay, you don't have to memorize this, but now you realize that we can learn something more and now we, that we know something about ligand effects, I want to show you a, a little bit about catalyst decay and rational ligand design. So what we did, and this is something that Manish did, another student of mine, well he looked at the decay of gold. He wanted to see why gold the case why do we lose so much gold in the reaction and the reason why we lose gold is because gold has poor stability at higher temperatures and therefore we need a large loading and that means we have low turnover numbers so what he wanted to do is ask these questions what causes the decay what causes the loss of gold why do we have to uh, in some cases we need a lot of gold and in some other cases we need little gold from the literature in some uh, some uh, reactions use a lot of gold some use very little why why and how can we help to stop or reduce that decay he really learned a lot about physical organic chemistry and uh, phosphorus NMR and uh, voltammetry uh, XPS spectroscopy, uh, a number of techniques that are not the average technique for the organic uh, student. But that told us something about the mechanism. He was able to, dis to um, state, he was able to discover 
that uh, gold undergoes disproportionation. In other words, gold one, our, uh, the original gold, this becomes or is converted to gold zero and gold uh, three, and then gold three uh, goes further or undergoes further um, uh, decompositions. So gold zero, which is what we obtain in every reaction, we always see deposits of gold zero, elemental gold, was uh, the, the result of this disproportionation. And that disproportionation was caused by uh, unsaturation, alkenes, alkynes, alenes. So it's very hard to avoid the disproportionation of gold because every time when you use a, a substrate, where you use an alkyne or an alkene, you're always going to have pi bonds. The pi bonds are going to complex with the, uh, with the gold ligand and they're going to promote this disproportionation. I'm not going to tell you too much about it because we, just, we published this recently, so I'm not going to, uh, it's, it's, uh, I can't see it here, but it's, uh, 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 we published it the year, uh, la early last year. But this tells us, this, this knowing something about gold told us how can we protect gold? How can we make gold more uh, stable? Well, we can make gold more stable by protecting, by having ligands, by designing ligands that can uh, actually uh, have biphenyl systems. We discovered that in our, I'm just telling you now, but we discovered that during the process. We found out that biphenyl systems had a very, very strong influence on, uh, on, the, uh, on the decay of gold. So uh, for type one reactions, where the stage one is a ready terminal step, this, uh, uh, which occurs normally when the substrate is less reactive, is an alkene or alene compared to an alkyne, or the nucleophile is weak, for this type of reactions, uh, uh, the ideal ligand would have electron withdrawing groups, okay, electron withdrawing groups to reduce electronic density, and a biphenyl system to stabilize the cationic gold. However, for type two reactions, which is the majority of, the, of gold catalyzed reactions, an electron rich ligand is helpful. So we need to have electron rich ligands like this as uh, uh, terbuthal groups or, and a biphenyl system to help stabilize the gold, but this has a lot of electron rich uh, substituents. And we know in that, we were, uh, Pendipika, another student of mine, was able to, the, to uh, synthesize in a very simple way in a very one, in a one step synthesis, this catalyst, uh, this ligand called L1. And L1 here in this table uh, which, uh, is shown uh, compared to many other well-known ligands, uh, the Buchwald type ligands or, or carbene ligands. And the, the blue, in, the, in this particular reaction, the blue indicates how much faster our cat ligand is compared to traditional or, or his uh, literature uh, ligands. Knowing what we learned, that is, in this case, biphenyl systems are important, and in this case, uh, uh, the protection by these uh, um, isopropo uh, isopropoxy groups, we were able to find a great ligand. And you can see clearly, uh, we can, uh, with our ligand, we can, any uh, reaction from the literature that it runs with 0.2 mole percent can be dropped to 25 parts per million. So uh, about the same yield, but much better, much better results using no, uh, uh, information that we already had learned that it from the type from this analysis of ligands, uh, whether uh, uh, for uh, uh, this analysis of ligands told us how to design something simple. I'm not telling you about the synthesis. The synthesis is very easy. We were it's uh, just one step synthesis. Uh, it's pretty much me, uh, it's important to have a biphenyl system to protect the gold, especially when the gold is a, a, um, a, a, it's a vinyl gold, in other words, in the middle of the reaction. And the, uh, it being so big avoids the formation of this uh, gold uh, based uh, uh, vinyl species that are not good. They tend to reduce the turnover. This is the actual X ray of this material. We are now can s we sell it through Aldrich. And we uh, published also at the end of the, uh, the beginning of next year of last year, and it's called bisphenols because we gave it the name bisphenol phosphine X D X stands for the person who discovered it in my group, and D is for the for the student who synthesized it. Deepika. And uh, this is just examples of how good the reaction is. The reaction is extreme. The, the ligand is so so good. I mean, we can go down to four, 40 parts per million 
whereas the literature rea uh, requires 1% and the yields are equal. This is for CH additions. For OH additions, we can go down to you know, uh, 0.1% compared to traditional 5%. The yields are equal. So we can improve tremendously the efficiency of the gold catalysis by uh, just designing ligands, learning first about the categories, the type 1, type 2, and it's the first skin of the onion. Then you learn about how can gold be protected. And we learn that we can, be, we can protect gold by having uh, biphenyl systems to protect gold, big uh, systems. And then that leads to this anal uh, to discovery. Discovery is not done in one step. It's done through a series of several steps. And that's what I'm trying to show you. And final, and, um, well, uh, this, in this example, or this new uh, uh, sort of a chapter, if you will, uh, we already know that ligand size matters. The question is now is, does counter ion size matter? Does it, ma does it matter how big is the size of the counter ion? Say, if you have uh, sodium chloride. Uh, does it matter if sodium is small or big uh, for carrying out reactions. How important is the size of the counter ion? We never ask those questions uh, in chemistry. We just use what we have. But size matters. And this is an exam example from the literature in which you can see that some of these reactions, the rate of the reaction has improved if, if you use a, a bigger counter ion. BARF is very big. I'll show you a, a, a more, uh, the structure later on. The bigger the counter ion, the faster the reaction. So we look at that a little bit more deep uh, in depth by David. David found out that this was an important problem because m over 70% of the uh, reactions done in the chemical industry in the world are ionic reactions. New SN1, SN2, eliminations, enolate chemistry, friedel craft all these reactions are examples of an ion ionic reaction. So it's an important area. And industry uses ionic reactions a lot. So it's important to learn if the, the size of the counter ion is important. Is it or not? And what we found out is that most commercial reagents have counter ions that are very small. The F4 triflate. Because they are cheaper to make. Okay? And easier to, 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 to synthesize. However, we had a hypothesis. Our hypothesis was, if you buy a, a, a reagent, an ionic reagent, uh, the, uh, and you make one of them bigger, the counter ion bigger, by using a big, big promoter, a big ionic promoter, we had the hypothesis that the bigger, the, if you do this, there's a reshuffling, in other words, what's going to happen is that the CTF3 is going to take the place of the A-, a minus. In other words, big or soft uh, are going to uh, pair up and, and small or hard are going to pair up. So if you have this, a big and a small, and a small and a big, what is going to happen is that the bigger ones, CTF3 and M, are going to come together and the small ones are going to come together. And this is going to help us do, the re do or have a, a faster reaction and a more efficient reaction. And for that, we need to have then big promoters. And this is a big promoter, but this is a bigger one. It has a, a carbon surrounded by three sulfonates. And BARF is commercially available. It's even bigger. All these are commercially available uh, uh, salts in which the counter ion, the negative charge, is bigger and bigger and bigger. So that matter because uh, something like this, which we call CTF3 minus, has the delocalized charge is going to be better, is going to be more efficiently delocalized. The size is bigger, is more stable than, than, the, than, the, than, the, uh, than nitrogen, and it's going to be, has less nucleophilicity. So that means something like this, if you add it to the reaction, should work. Should, do, should give you a better, uh, more efficient reaction. And that's what I'm, I will show you now here. This is not published, but we just got these results uh, in the last few months. You can see here, look, a simple hydroamination, the addition of, a nit of an amine to a triple bond. This reaction, adding f with, a, with a standard 5% uh, 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 gold catalyst loading, adding 15% uh, of 
by weight of the promoter, in this case KCTS3, improves the reaction tremendously compared to no additive at all. So the, uh, without additive, the reaction only goes 20 percent, does not go to completion. You put a KCTS3 and within two, 10 hours you have almost 70 percent completion. Or you can, another, as another example, uh, this is a, a rearrangement the reaction of uh, this alanyl ester. The rearrangement of the oxygen goes over here. Uh, go, I'm sorry, goes over here. This rearrangement without additive, just without promoter, just with a, lig with a catalyst, only 30%. So it's a very poor, inefficient reaction. As soon as you start to put the, the, the promoters that I told you about, you go better and better and even much better. And here you have a 100% conversion very quickly. So, so these examples and the, these ones are over here, these are uh, other types of cationic gold reactions. You can see that without promoter, the relative rate is like one. As soon as you start to add big promoters, big counter ions, you increase the relative rate of the reaction. The reaction goes faster and faster uh, when you add this, a little bit of this uh, counter ions. In other words, you, uh, uh, when you do something like this, uh, adding these counter ions, uh, these uh, as salts, I mean, with a large counter ion, the reshuffling takes place. And why this takes place is due to a, no, to a hypothesis. I'm not, not going to explain it to you. It's a, I can talk about it later on, but it's a, it's a theory that we have. We haven't proved it completely, but it's a theory that has to do with size. And I'm just going to bypass, I'm not going to talk about it because of time. But the important thing is to see how everything works. This is a now classical Lewis acid catalyzed reactions. And as soon as we put a little bit, just as twice as much as the, as the loading. If you use 5% of, uh, of this uh, uh, free, uh, Lewis acid, 10% of the promoter, in this case uh, uh, KCTF3, improves the, red, the, the rate of the reaction by 100 fold, 100 times. Okay, so again, is, or, or if without a promoter, uh, you have a less than 1% of the three hours. Without a, with, with a promoter, you have a, a, a huge increase in yield and, and, and uh, efficiency. And this is another example. I'm just going to bypass this one. So I hope I told you some, uh, you learned something about the fact that ligand effects, if you, if you study them correctly, and catalyst decay, how, how to study the, uh, why the, uh, these problems occur, why l gold is uh, decayed, lost, and why ligands are, uh, what is the purpose of ligands in, the, in, the, in, a, cattle, in a, re, a gold catalyzed reaction can give us useful information that we can use for uh, synthesis. But I'm just going to tell you then in the next uh, few minutes is uh, tell you something about these two other aspects of, of, of gold, two other aspects of these components of a reaction, just talking about B. How do we start with gold? Well, we have to use we usually use a gold chloride with a ligand. We treat it with silver, some silver salt. And usually that's how we activate gold. That's why we convert a pre-catalyst, a gold pre-catalyst, into a true catalyst, into cationic gold. And these methods are traditional. They are, everybody uses them, but they have a lot of problems. Ex expense, uh, side effects, and preparation. Other non-silver activation, in other words, without using the silver, you can treat, you can have some interesting results, but they are very limited, limited to few reactions. They're not really um, general. So one of my other students, Junbin and Naoto, a Japanese student that was in my lab for two months, three months, and a, a student, that, a former uh, PhD student of mine is no longer with me, uh, they, uh, they discovered this interesting uh, imido gold pre-catalyst that you can activate, in other words, you can generate the cationic gold simply by treating it with acid. You treat this with acid, this cleaves, and you, and you activate or you generate the cationic gold. And again, we, we published that re recently in the literature, and I'm just going to tell you that this reaction was very useful uh, for us. But Let's go back to the hydrogen, to the gold catalytic cycle, stage one, stage two. Li a nucleophilic at attack on an activated alkyne, and stage two, protodeoration. And here what you can see is that there's an intermediate C, which is crucial. And this intermediate C is, needs to uh, become, needs to lose the gold. But this is a very hard thing to do. Why? Because 
it's, this is usually a stable species. It's very hard for the nucleophile, this NU, to lose that proton. And it's very hard for a proton to come here because this is already a, ca a, a cationic species, a positive charged species. So this is a hard problem. In fact, so hard that you can isolate, in, in many cases you have, uh, we have isolated this C, this, this, this intermediate has been isolated on many occasions because they are so stable, they can be purified and isolated. So how can we, how can we activate this intermediate C so that this reaction, this next step can take place fast? Well, one way to do it is something that uh, Manish and we both did together and they just, I'm going to skip this a little bit, they, um, they just found another way to the, um, another type of hydrogen bonding. Most, most of the hydrogen bonding that you study or I study is associated with pKa. We think that the, uh, a stronger hydrogen bond acceptor is one that has a high uh, pKa and uh, vice versa. But we learned that this was a very interesting work by a, a, fr a French a physical chemist that discovered a new type of hydrogen bond uh, parameter. It's called the pKBHX parameter, the hydrogen bond basicity. And he came up with a number of uh, very nice uh, studies and nice uh, work that actually told us a lot about pKBHX. pKBHX is not like pKa. pKBHX has a very short uh, range from minus one to five and is not related to basicity. It's related to, to a different type, to a charge transfer complex, a, ch a charge, tra and I'm not going to talk about it right now, it's just to tell you that it, it, we this, uh, found that this, the hydrogen bonding effect of a, uh, the derived from pKBHX is much larger than the, than, than the regular pKa. In other words, here what we found out is that by adding an additive, additive, and in this case a pyridine oxide that has a very high pKBHX, we can then uh, re remove the proton from, the, from this intermediate, remove it like this by charge transfer, and lead to the protodeuration uh, uh, protocol. In other words, by using an additive that is not a, as a base, but a, is a hydrogen bond, it has a high hydrogen bonding basicity, we, we are able to uh, carry out to pr promote the reaction. And this, uh, we've, we also published this la uh, later, la uh, early last year, we discovered that additives that you can, that added to the reaction can improve the proto deauration in very, in, in uh, dramatic ways. Here you have uh, the, how fast, for example, a, the presence of an additive like pyridine oxide is compared to no additive or compared to uh, um, is le lesser hydrogen bonders. <coughs> and now I'm just going to uh, talk about the substrate. I look at the substrate. Look at the alk. I'm going to talk about alkynes. I like alkynes, and you'll see why in a minute. But I also like fluorine, as uh, uh, pro uh, Professor Stevens said, uh, Pierre said, that I like fluorine. I have done my work with fluorine. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about fluorine. Why is it important? Why fluorine is important in medicine? Because 20% uh, of the top 200 pharmaceuticals in the U.S. contain fluorine. And most of the agrochemicals have fluorine. In fact, there's over 150 powerful or very popular fluorinated, fluorinated drugs in the market. The majority of these uh, uh, drugs have aromatic fluorine or aromatic trifluoromethyls. We were looking and we tried for many years to develop or in, in expand the, the, the space of fluorine. And what we did, and we spent many years doing, is trying to generate molecular diversity with fluorine using alines, propargyl systems, and cumulin systems, and the in systems. We, this is something that we spend a lot of time. The, is the, richer, the chemistry gets richer as you go from here to here, but of course, it's more difficult to generate and to work with as you go from here to here. So the difficulty of generation is uh, parallel to the richness of chemistry. And the green is CHF or CF2. The purple is, uh, could be silicon or tin or methyls or halides or phosphorus. 
All this would contribute to make the floor, to have more sophisticated building blocks, fluorinated building blocks. But um, I'm not going to tell you all the story that, about that today, just to tell you a few things. We, were, uh, we discovered nice chemistry that helped us to uh, make, uh, uh, to, uh, to uh, do reactions that were impossible. This is an impossible reaction, and you can't do an SN2 reaction here. So we discovered a nice way to generate a indium, organoindium species, and then an attack on an aline to form that product. So these are uh, things that we published several years ago, but this helped us to expand the frontiers of CF2 substitution. We were able to bypass this problem and generate new and richer chemistry. But to make fluorine, you have to add fluorine. And fluorine is expensive. If you have, a, these are common electrophilic sources of fluorine, as they like fluor, etc. This costs a lot of money. These are uh, American dollars, a thousand dollars for a mole of select fluor, or uh, you know, eighty-eight thousand dollars for a mole of this uh, NF pyridinium fluoride. Even these uh, nucleophilic sources are expensive. Twelve, twelve hundred, one thousand two hundred dollars for a silver fluoride. The cheapest one is, of course, HF. HF is only 23 cents per mole is the cheapest. But you can't, it's very hard to work, very reactive. So uh, but George Olam, who used to be a, a professor, um, uh, Stevens or Pierce, Pierre, uh, uh, advisor or supervisor, uh, uh, helped, uh, developed this pyridine HF reagent, which is not that bad. It's, it's not as, as expensive as these ones, but still, and it works. Uh, this, uh, all our reagents uh, are uh, well known, are, but they have a lot of problems. A lot of problems. They are, uh, m they are uh, either poor, they have a poor behavior, performance in metal based fluorination, or they are uh, like this triethylamine HF is not good when you are dealing with uh, metals that have, are very sensitive to bases or, or uh, uh, acid sensitive species. I'm sorry, base sensitive uh, reactions. So here you have them. HF alone is very hard. Volatile, hazardous. Bases can limit the reactivity in acid catalyzed reactions. And also bases can coordinate with metals and destroy the efficiency of reactions. So there are many problems with the OLR reagent. And uh, Elijah, came up with a very good way using this hydrogen bonding concept that I told you before, he came up with another interesting, uh, a, very, a good alternative to the OLAR reagent using this DMPU, which is a solvent, dimethyl, uh, dimethyl, uh, uh, DMPU HF has a very high PKBHX compared to triethylamine or pyridine. It's a stronger hydrogen bond acceptor. It's a weaker base than triethylamine or pyridine and is much weaker nucleophile than either one of these. So this could be in principle a very nice, a very nice uh, nucleophilic fluorinating agent. And indeed it is, is a very, uh, we were able to do monofluorinations very nicely with from alkynes in, a, in, in very in a great yields as you can see here by using this DMPU HF and a, a, our amido gold catalyst is not shown here or uh, difluorinations. AU1 stands for the imido gold that I mentioned to you, that one that uh, uh, now this Japanese student uh, synthesized for me in a, in a few months. So here you see again, great yields, good scope from this DMPUHF. And this was something that we just published uh, just last, uh, last, late, late last year, uh, at the end of last year. And it, it, we were, uh, it was nice to see that we were, uh, we were um, talked about in the CNE news at the end of last year, and it's now going to be soon uh, commercially available in Al through Aldrich, hopefully. So this is something that we like because it shows that we can do not just uh, uh, chemistry in the lab, but take it to commercial venues, to take it commercially, make it practical. You know, and I'm just going to uh, f f f finish with something that I'm going to uh, put because I know that uh, Pierre works a little. Now I just found out Pierre works with uh, uh, trying to do uh, uses a heterogeneous catalysis. We're now looking into heterogeneous ca uh, gold catalysts ourselves, 
We are now using to uh, looking into uh, lo uh, using gold uh, titanium oxide. Uh, uh, this is a nano sized gold in uh, titanium, as well as other uh, 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 supports, metal supports, to carry out reactions, typical organic reactions. This is a, a hydration. It's a, a gold catalyzed hydration of alkynes under basic conditions. This is very hard. Most of the alkynes are hydrolyzed under acidic conditions. But acidic conditions are, have a lot of problems. So that's why we looked into using a gold, a nano sized gold, uh, with morpholine as a, as a, as a co catalyst. And we were able to get great yields with even with substrates that are very sensitive, like this uh, sugar, for example, very sensitive to acid hydrolysis or this uh, uh, hemi um, uh, as hemiacetals. So you can see that, uh, or this uh, silicon protected. Uh, alkynes, they're all resistant to the uh, conditions of this reaction because we are using a, a base instead of uh, acid. And also, uh, this we published at the beginning of this year in Organic Letters. And we, because it's heterogeneous, we can now look at the possibility of doing these reactions on a, um, a, and recover the catalyst, and this is shows you uh, the use of this ligand one, two, three, four, five times, the yield drops a little bit every time, but this make, means that we can use it in flow reactor conditions, under flow reactor conditions. The yield uh, this drops over, over after, you know, 100 hours, but that's because gold uh, gets uh, agglomerated. Gold starts to uh, aggregate. This nano sized gold starts to lose the nano side properties and become bigger and bigger. And we did that by using uh, stamp images. We noticed that with the fresh catalyst is that you can see the nano sized gold, that little uh, uh, bright spot. As you can see, as the more you use the catalyst, the more, the bigger the, the bright spots. That means the gold is, is becoming agglomerated. And, uh, but there was no change in the oxidation state. So pretty much the loss of activity is, is a physical loss. It's a, it's a physical process, prop, uh, process, the agglomeration, aggregation, not change of oxidation states. Uh, as you know, gold, nano-sized gold, na at, the, at the nano level, uh, it's not just gold zero. There's gold one, gold three. And so we know that, we knew that. And when we did some XPS studies, we found that the gold one and gold three a, a presence in the fresh and the spent did not change, which means there was no change in gold oxidation. The uh, change happened by aggregation. In any case, we are working on that now. We are doing more and more uh, looking at other reagents, uh, other reactions that we can catalyze with heterogeneous gold because if we use a heterogeneous gold, we can recycle the catalyst and we can turn this into a more sustainable chemistry, a green chemistry. So, in conclusions, uh, some of the things that I've talked about today are the uh, uh, ligand effects. We can, if you categorize a reaction, you have a power, you have more power. You can, you can predict how to improve a reaction, knowing what are the, uh, uh, the effects of ligands. And that tells, uh, if we learn about that, we can also learn about what makes gold decay and if we learn how gold decays, we can find something about how to protect gold, how to keep gold active for longer times. And that led us into developing ligands that were able to protect gold and, and make gold more reactive, as I show you with those uh, uh, parts per million performances of uh, parts per million loadings that I showed you earlier. I also talked to you about the silver free activation. Uh, the, the very nice idea or very nice use of PKBHX to uh, increase the efficiency of gold catalyzed reactions by using this PKBHX concept. Talk to you about how we use PKBHX to tame, to uh, uh, make HF more easily handled, more easily um, um, reacted. And finally, I didn't say that in the conclusions, Heterogeneous gold is something that we are now looking into as a way to uh, make it, the gold chemistry more and more green, more and more uh, environmentally friendly. So this um, pretty much concludes the chemistry part of my talk. I want to say a few things about my, the people that did the work, because I didn't do the work, and the ideas were not mine. 
the ideas were from my students. So las ideas no eran mías, no fueron nunca mías, eh, fueron de mis estudiantes. Yo dejo que mis estudiantes jueguen en el laboratorio, eh, joguen, joguen en el laboratorio, en, 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 porque los estudiantes, ustedes, tienen mucha capacidad y mucha energía, energía, entusiasmo y creatividad. Yo ya no, yo mi, mi hard disk está full, full, mi hard disk está ya eh, osificado. Entonces mis estudiantes juegan and they and I let them do it. The only thing I lo, lo único que yo hago es dar experiencia. Haz eso, sí, sí está bien. Eso mm, quizás no haz otra cosa. Just, I give some experience, some a little bit of coaching. Like like a you know, like a parent to a son or daughter. So this is the first person I want to thank is uh, Professor Bo Zhu. He was a student of mine, a PhD student from, and, and, and a research professor in my lab. Uh, that's, this is in October. He went back to China. He had a very good position. They offered him a great position in China. Uh, and he went to China. Uh, this is now the current group now. This is a, a number of people, most of the graduate students. This is a, during Christmas time. We, we, we decorate the, la, the, the corridor with Christmas decorations. Uh, Everton was a, a sandwich student from Brazil, from the University of Santa Maria, and he spent a couple of months in my lab, three months last year. This is the day that he was leaving. He was very happy to go back to, uh, to uh, Rio Grande do Sul. Uh, he's a, he's a, a nice, nice, nice student. And uh, he, the new, a new postdoc is going to join my group in next June uh, from Chicago. He's a, he's a uh, professor, a uh, Georgian student, and uh, we're going to have him uh, replacing a uh, uh, ball. Not many people, very few people, but you know, each one, each one has, you know, has um, a big job, a job of uh, the, the, the discovering chemistry, discovering new chemistry, and and uh, and, uh, and they help each other, and, and, and they are happy doing that. Uh, I have to uh, acknowledge uh, people, uh, uh, agencies in the United States, uh, in the National Science Foundation, the National Institutes of Health. Uh, the Fulbright Fellowship that is, uh, happen, uh, is supporting my stay in Brazil until May, uh, since uh, early February. I've been here pretty much uh, in Unicampi, at Campinas, and, uh, and that's uh, supported by the Fulbright uh, under the uh, Science Without Borders program. Uh, the uh, German Research Foundation that supported my, uh, some of my work in, uh, uh, in Heidelberg uh, using uh, gold chemistry. And uh, now a little bit about Louisville, Kentucky. Louisville, Kentucky is in uh, right here, about five hours by car from Chicago. It's about maybe uh, eight, nine hours or ten hours from New York, New York City, and many, very, very, very far away from uh, from where from where you were from Southern California. So it's on the on the uh, river of the Ohio River. The Ohio River is a large river that divides Kentucky from Indiana. The Ohio River becomes the Mississippi later on. So the Ohio River starts around here, goes around here, and then becomes the Mississippi. Okay, so in Louisville, can, is, can, here is the, the, the main city, the major city in Kentucky. Kentucky is a small state, but it's famous. Famous for the church, for Kentucky Derby. It's a big, big uh, horse racing once a year. It, uh, it's the biggest, the most famous uh, horse race in the world. It happens in May. Also very famous for uh, bourbon, for uh, which is uh, whiskey, Kentucky whiskey, and of course Kentucky Fried Chicken, which is something that people know about it, and uh, uh, and the uh, slugger. This is for baseball. It's very famous for base for baseball. But if you're not American, you don't. Uh, that's something that is not imp that important. <laughs> and the University of Louisville, of course, is uh, in the city, in the middle of the city. It has a lot of uh, 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 like many universities in the United States, big big uh, athletics, football, not football, football. But uh, American football is a big thing. You can see this is a, no, it's not Maracana, but it's, it's a big stadium. Uh, uh, and this is the basketball arena. It's huge. Basketball arena is 20, 22,000 people. Basketball arena. It's a big, big arena. But basketball is very big. We were national champions about two years ago. And so that's a big um, basketball and, foot, and American football are big. Uh, and of course, this is a science building where I am. Uh, um, then my lab itself is very nice. I, I just designed it or uh, renovated my lab about three years ago. This is my daughter, when she, she was cutting the ribbons for the new lab. The new lab was designed by me. It has the uh, students are in the middle here. They have 
access to their labs by uh, windows. And the labs uh, are, have work of art, because I like work of art. And, and so I have uh, the, the Art Institute of the university lend me some oil paintings that I like. So we hang these paintings in the lab. And uh, so if you are weighing your compound, you can be inspired by art. <laughs> OK. And, uh, and, uh, and it's very clean. You know, so the, the students make it, keep it very clean, too, because they don't want to uh, damage anything. Um, this was, uh, so this, and this is, well, so this, there are two big rooms. One room here and the other one on the other side. And this is, the stu this is where the students uh, usually are. Uh, this is, I live in a farm. I don't live in the city. I live about 50 kilometers from the city. Uh, but it's easy driving. It's not, it's not, it's not much traffic. In uh, Louisville is about 900,000 people. So it's not like uh, uh, Rio or Sao Paulo. Uh, and I live in the farm. This is where the, the, this is the stables where the farm. I don't live here. This is where the horses live. I have, <laughs> I have horses. I have horses. But this is my farm in the summer. It's not like that in the winter. Uh, I have horses. I play polo. So because I play polo, I need horses. And I have to keep the horses somewhere. These are my horses. And this is important. Horses for, for, that are used for polo are only always female horses, never the male horses. The females are smarter. They, have, they are also much more, um, much more willing. They have a hard, a stronger hearts. You know, they just go all the way. I mean, this is just, uh, the male horses are very, kind of a little slow in some kinds here too. So, if all, if all, my, all my horses are, are mares. And, uh, and uh, uh, this is a, my, my big, this is a, this is my big Kentucky tree. This is a tree that is about 200 years old in front of my house. My house is uh, uh, behind the tree. But I, this is in fall. In the fall, there are big, two big, huge trees. And I, I made a very interesting art because this is in the fall, the two trees, big trees, like the, the stable here. And in the winter, no, no leaves. This is where I sit and I meditate here. <laughs> I just, no, I just don't meditate. I just, it is uh, just part of the farm. It's a very beautiful farm. And this is a, I like this tree very much because it's so big, so massive. Although here you have a lot of big trees too. Anyway, so I'm just, I, I didn't talk about hydration. I didn't talk about hydration because it's too much. But um, what I want to tell you is, and in summary, in, in, in resume, in sumario, what I have, what I have said, is I hope you, you, you see that a reaction can give you many layers. And just by looking into a reaction deeper and deeper, you can find very useful information. A reaction has more meanings than the surface indicates. Just like the onion. The onion has more meanings underneath than on the outside. And even the leftover of the onion, la, 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 la cascara de la cebolla, can be source of art and discovery. And I hope I, can, I mentioned that by the ligands that talked about it, by the additives, the size of the counter ions, this concept of hydrogen bonding uh, basicity, which is new. I didn't invent it. I had to use it. I was looking for solutions. Heterogeneous gold catalysis, fluorination, so many things. Always from the same source. Always from the same source. One source, many, many uh, caminos, muchas rutas, trillas, 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 no? Trillas. So that's, keep that in mind, because that's important for uh, when, you, when you go into the, into the real world and have this concept. Not, never, never concentrate on the, on, the, on the surface. Go always under the surface. Always look behind, underneath. Debajo, uh, uh, bajo, in bajo, always in bajo. I think very important. Okay, um, and more, uh, the last thing, always ha have let your students play, enjoy it. Don't put constraints. The, 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 don't don't the, don't act like a military. <laughs> you know, don't, don't put stops. Always let the students uh, because they are the ones that are going to come up with the creativity with enthusiasm. <laughs> That's what I do. Anyway, thank you very much. Uh, muito obrigado. <laughs>